Okay, the last speaker of this session is Artem Kopp to talk about sex-specific evolutionary innovations. All right, thank you very much. I, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here and the rest of you hearty souls for sticking around till the bitter end. I'll try to be brief and entertaining. So this talk will be about uh, sexual dimorphism which, at least to me, is a very fascinating topic. So if you look at different animals, one of the first things you notice is that most of them are sexually dimorphic, but every one of them is dimorphic in its own special ways. So if you look at these guys, so we have, what, lions and pheasants and parakeets, and I hope I can get this mouse to work, and butterflies, beetles, spiders, in all of them, males are different from females, but the traits that distinguish females from males are completely different in every case. So obviously these animals are all related by some underlying phylogeny. So what this really means is that during the evolution of virtually any animal lineage, some new sex-specific characters will be gained and some of the older characters will be lost. And so what we really want to understand is how that happens. So starting with Darwin's second very famous book, and for 150 years, evolution biologists have been trying to understand why that happens. And we have very well developed theories of sexual selection and antagonistic evolution and interlocal sexual conflict. We have good detailed quantitative descriptions of why this should happen. What we really don't understand is how that happens, the nuts and bolts of this thing. What is changing at the level of DNA sequences and cells to generate these new sex specific structures. So that is what much of our lab works on. And one of our main models is the sex comb. So uh, by the way, both Pierre and Pam showed sex combs in the introductory slides. Did you see that? <laughs> I did. So we have the third talk about sex combs in a row. Anyway, so for those of you who accidentally strayed here from the ciliate meeting, uh, so the sex comb is this group of modified mechanosensory bristles on the front legs of males. So this is essentially a grasping implement that the males d use during courtship behavior and mating. So, uh, but the nicest thing about the sex combs, as far as I'm concerned, is that the vast majority of Drosophila species do not have them. It is a fairly recent evolutionary innovation that appeared within the genus Drosophila, and it shows very diverse morphology among close related species. So for us, that is really a wonderful model to study evolutionary innovation because essentially this is an evolution of a new organ apparently out of nothing. So just to orient you a little bit on the Drosophila phylogeny, so this big mess is the phylogeny of Drosophilids and some of the sequence genomes are shown in blue. And this lineage on top in pink so these are really the only flies, or almost the only flies, that have sex combs. So they are limited to the melanogaster and the related obscure species groups. That's actually a little white lie. Uh, I'm oversimplifying, but I'll be happy to tell you more about it later. So within that one relatively small lineage, relatively small, it's about 200 species, about of 3,000, uh, there is a lot of examples of rapid divergence in sex comb morphology. There are examples of convergent evolution of similar sex combs in different lineages, sometimes through very different cellular mechanisms. There are examples of the secondary loss. So this is really a very rich playground to understand the origin and diversification of a new sexual trait. So here are some of the examples of what you would see in different species. What the kind of sex combs that you see in Drosophila melanogaster is just one example of the trait. So you can see here that in some of these species, like Drosophila variants, it only has these very simple wimpy sex combs that are organized in transverse rows. And then in other species, the sex combs will be rotated, oriented along the proximal distal axis of the leg. So some species have only a couple of teeth on one tarsal segment. Some species have 40 to 50 teeth 
organized on the first and second tarsal segment. You can see the differences affect the location, size, orientation of these sex combs, the modifications of the individual bristle shafts. So there's really a lot of diversity in those 200 species if you care to look. So that really sets up our question. So we know what the ancestral condition was. So this is the leg of a species that primitively lacks sex combs. You cannot tell whether that's a male or a female. Neither can I, and I've been, I've been working on them for almost 20 years. So in this case, the morphology is really completely sexual and monomorphic. We know what the ancestral condition is. And from that ancestral condition, you have the origin not just of one, but of many different derived character states. We see very different and dramatic sexual dimorphic morphology. So of course we would love to understand how that happens. So the way the sex comb actually develops, uh, on the ventral surface of the front legs, the bristles, the mechanosensory bristles, are organized in these transverse bristle rows. So that is a cleaning implement. This is what the flies use for grooming. If you ever see a bigger, like a house fly or something like that, rubbing its eyes. This is the brush that they use to clean dust and other stuff off of their eyes. So uh, this uh, set of transverse rows is present in the vast majority of dipterans in both males and females. So in Drosophila melanogaster, the sex comb develops from the most distal of these transverse bristle rows. So the sex comb is homologous to these bristles. It's just that in females, nothing happens to them. They just sit there. They remain identical to the other bristles on the leg. But in males, the entire bristle row rotates 90 degrees during pupil development. And then the individual bristle shafts become modified into these curved teeth uh, to make a sex home. So that's how it works in Drosophila melanogaster. It can work very differently in other species, despite producing a similar outcome. So I will not talk about cell biology of sex comb development today, but that's kind of a fascinating subject in its own right. What I do want to talk about is uh, the genetic control of sex combs and how the sex comb initiation occurs in Drosophila. So uh, obviously, because the sex combs are only present on the front legs, they have to be controlled by the hox code. So in this case, uh, the responsible gene is SCR, or sex combs reduced. That's actually how the gene got its name. So it is expressed in the first thoracic segment in Drosophila, and it controls the identity of that first thoracic segment. But it turned out that uh, the role of SCR in directing sex comb development is actually much more specific than simply specifying the identity of the segment on which they occur. So uh, this is kind of the classical phenotype. So you have the wild type male on the left, and then an SCR mutant that lacks SCR expression in the front leg is here. So you get a complete transformation from first leg to second leg identity, and that includes the loss of the sex bone. But if you look at SCR expression during the pupil stage when the sex comb actually develops, it turns out that SCR expression within the leg is decidedly non-uniform. That actually in most of the first thoracic segment, SCR expression levels are very low. And SCR is specifically upregulated in those parts of the leg that are destined to produce T1 specific structures, namely the transverse bristle rows and the sex comb. So here, this is the site of future sex combs, and you can see the upregulation of SCR expression here. And what's more, if you express SCR ectopically in males and the rest of the T1 leg, you can get ectopic sex combs. So that spatial regulation of SCR expression is very important. It's not just important to have it on in the right place, you also have to have it off in the rest of the leg to get proper sex comb development. So uh, essentially, the expression of SCR within the leg is controlled by the intrasegmental patterning cues. So all those genes that set up the anterior, posterior, and dorsoventral, and posterior, uh, and proximal distal axis within the leg, they're responsible for that spatially restricted expression of SCR. Now, on top of that, 
it turns out that SCR expression in the leg is sexually dimorphic. That in males, you can see this upregulation in the distal part of the first tarsal segment where the sex comb will develop. In females, no such, no such uh, upregulation occurs. Actually, it's slightly downregulated here. And so that is controlled by the sex determination gene double sex. So if you look in this, uh, in the comparative context, in species that primitively lack sex combs, such as this guy, Drosophila willistani, SCR expression in the leg is low and sexually monomorphic. So the same thing is seen to the first approximation in these species that have wimpy transverse sex combs. So for example, in Drosophila ananasi, you don't really see much difference in SCR expression between males and females and SCR expression in the tarsal segment is generally low. On the other hand, if you look at these species with giant sex combs, so this is Drosophila ficus phyla, SCR is expressed very strongly in the first and second tarsal segments where the sex comb develop, and SCR expression is also sexually dimorphic. It's obviously different between males and females, so you can quantify that with antibody stainings, or you can measure that by quantitative PCR. And essentially in species that lack sex combs, you see sexually monomorphic expression of SCR. And in species with sec with, that do have big sex combs, uh, SCR is expressed several fold higher in males than in females. So another difference that I want to point out is the location of the sex comb because it will be important later. So as you know, Drosophila melanogaster has only one sex comb on the first tarsal segment. That is actually an exception. Most species that have sex combs at all have sex combs on the first and second tarsal segments. And this distal sex comb has been lost independently several times on this phylogeny. So the species that are shown in red they're the ones that have secondarily lost SCR expression, uh, uh, sorry, sex combs on the second tarsal segment. And it turns out that that character correlates very well with the pattern of SCR expression. That in species that have the second sex comb, you can see high level of SCR expression in the segment. And in species that lack the sex combs on the second segment, SCR expression in the segment is low. So we went on and identified the cis regulatory elements that control SCR expression in the leg. I have this curse for my entire life. For some reason, I end up working in absolutely enormous genes. And SCR, like most hoax genes in Drosophila, is pretty damn big. So uh, this work was actually started in Tom Kaufman's lab back in the 80s. And we relied on some of Tom Kaufman's work to identify uh, the regulatory elements of SCR. So it turns out that the leg enhancer is actually located on the far side of Fushitara, so it's closer to Antenopedia than, than to SCR. But this is the enhancer, or the main enhancer, that is responsible for SCR expression in the leg. And this chunk of DNA recapitulates SCR expression in the leg fairly well. So uh, what we also did, we decided to test the importance of that enhancer in viva. And we used uh, nuclease targeting and homologous gene replacement to delete this enhancer. And you get the predicted phenotype. So this is the wild type male. If you delete this enhancer, you essentially get a null SCR phenotype in the leg. You get a pretty much complete transformation of the first leg to the second leg identity, including a complete loss of the sex cell. So that is clearly the important piece of DNA. And we started looking at the evolution of that enhancer. So this is what it does in Drosophila melanogaster. So uh, if you take the SCR enhancer, fuse it to GFP, drive expression in Drosophila melanogaster, you get the sexually dimorphic expression where it's upregulated in the males but not in females. So it recapitulates the expression of the native SCR gene pretty well. If you now take the same piece of DNA from a species that primitively lacks sex combs, it does drive gene expression, but it is not sexually dimorphic. Again, if anything, you do not see this upregulation around the sex combs in enhancers from species that lack the sex comb. On the other hand, 
If you take species that have these big sex combs on the second tarsal segment, so here again is the melanogaster piece, you can see it's expressed very strongly in the first tarsal segment and very little in the second. If you take the homologous enhancer from a species with two sex combs, you see very strong activity of that enhancer in the second tarsal segment as well as the first. So we really think that the diversification of sex comb morphology was driven at least in part by cis-regular changes in SCR, specifically by DNA sequence changes in this far upstream enhancer of SCR. So that is one part of the story. Uh, the second part is the sex difference, right? So the sex comb is only present in males, which means it must be controlled by the sex determination pathway one way or another. So the uh, somatic sex determination in Drosophila is one of those classical stories in evolutionary, uh, in developmental biology. So much of this pathway was worked on uh, by Tom Klein and Ken Burtis and Bruce Baker. So it is controlled by alternative splicing, right? So you have this uh, cascade of alternative splicing events that eventually results in the production of alternative male or female isoforms of the transcription factor double sex. And you have the male-specific isoform of double sex promoting the development of male traits and suppressing female traits, and then you have a female isoform of double sex which promotes female and suppresses male traits. <coughs> So that's been known for a long time. What was not appreciated until fairly recently is that in most cells, in Drosophila, there's nothing to splice. So double sex turns out to be transcribed in a very specific pattern. So in most cells in Drosophila, there is no double sex transcription and therefore no sexual dimorphism. Essentially, most cells in flies don't know their sex, except for those which compensation. So it's only the cells that have to go through sex-specific differentiation that activate double sex transcription. Then this entire splicing cascade kicks in, splice it into the male or female isoform, and you get male or female-specific development. So this is something that was found a few years ago in Bruce Baker's lab and Michelle Beitman's and ours and several hours. Kind of there was a flurry of papers showing that. So that really changes the way we think about the development and evolution of sex-specific traits. So in the case of the sex comb, double sex is expressed in this crescent of cells in the first leg discs. So this is the part of the leg that will develop sex combs. If you look at other legs discs, so this is the second leg disc, there is no double sex expression there. And then later in development, at the pupil stage, double sex expression becomes confined to this patch of cells that make up the sex combs and the epithelial cells immediately around the sex combs that are involved in the rotation of that tissue. So again, just the cells that have to go through sex-specific differentiation actually express double sex. So this is a well-known thing, that if you knock out double sex, the null phenotype is intermediate between males and females, that you get these intersexes, which have something in intermediate between the sex comb and the normal female bristles. But what's interesting is that, again, if you take the male-specific isoform of double sex and you express that ectopically in males, you get ectopic sex combs. So just as in the case of SCR, the spatially restricted expression is really important. It's not just important to have it on in the right place, you also have to have it off in other places. So it turns out that the expression of double sex in the front leg is controlled by SCR. And if you knock down SCR in the first leg, you lose double sex. If you activate SCR ectopically in the posterior legs, you get ectopic double sex expression. So you have the situation where double sex regulates SCR, but SCR also regulates double sex. So in this sense, to put it in Mike Acom's terms, despite the importance, both the Hox and the sex determination genes are acting more as micromanagers than master regulators. That they're intimately integrated into this intrasegmental patterning network both the Hox and the sex determination genes are only activated in a relatively small subset of cells that will make the sex call. And this autoregulatory loop between double sex and SCR stabilizes sex comb's expression and is necessary for activating the, the downstream target genes, most of which we still don't know. 
So again, if you put it in the comparative context, so this is Drosophila melanogaster with one small sex comb and one small patch of double sex expression. You look at species that have giant sex combs and they will have a giant domain of double sex expression corresponding to this entire field of cells that will make the sex comb. Of course, the really big question is what happens with, uh, in species that do not have sex combs. And to the first approximation, nothing. So this is the species that primitively lack sex combs. If you look at lack development, there is no double sex expression here. So in the ancestral condition, at least in this stage in development, double sex was simply not expressed in the front leg, which makes perfect sense because the legs of most Drosophila species are sexually monomorphic. They do not need to know what sex they belong to. So double sex is another one of those really big genes, and eventually we did find the enhancer that controls double sex expression in the leg. So it is expressed in this patch of about 100 cells in males and in females, and it recapitulates the expression of native double sex pretty well. So uh, if you look at it in Drosophila melanogaster, again, this enhancer will direct expression in this patch of cells that will make the sex comb. If you look at the same homologous piece of sequence from a species that primitively lacks sex combs, it does not drive any gene expression in the leg, which corresponds to the lack of double sex expression in the species, at least at this stage in leg development. So what about the diversification of sex comb? So here's one example. This is Drosophila melanogaster with a single sex comb. Here's a fairly close related species, Drosophila bipectinata. It has a double sex comb that occupies almost the entire first tarsal segment in the species. So if you take the double sex, sex comb enhancer from Drosophila bipectinata, put it into Drosophila melanogaster, you can see it drives a much wider expression pattern than the Drosophila melanogaster enhancer. And if you use this enhancer to drive the expression of male-specific double sex isoform in Drosophila melanogaster, you get this double sex comb, which is not quite as pretty as the normal sex comb that you see in Drosophila bipectinata, but it recapitulates the size and position of the bipectinata sex comb very well. So again, just as in the case of SCR, we think that the, uh, the evolution of the cis-regular elements of double sex has played a very important role in the origin and diversification of the sex comb. So as with SCR, we use CRISPRs to take out this enhancer, and you get, you don't quite get a null phenotype, so you get a strong feminization of the sex comb in males, and you get a masculinization of the sex comb in females, but it's not quite the null phenotype. It turns out that we probably did not take out the, in the entire enhancer, unfortunately. So uh, the actual situation turns out to be more difficult than I told you in, uh, in the beginning. There are actually at least two double sex enhancers. So there is the late enhancer and the early enhancer, which are separate regulatory elements that direct different expression patterns in different stages. So the early enhancer is activated during prepupal development, and uh, later it becomes restricted to epithelial cells, and the late enhancer drives expression much later in development only in bristle cells. So it turns out that in those CRISPR knockouts, we did not delete part of the early enhancer, so there's still residual double sex expression there. So we still need to generate a more complete knockout. So the way we think about this uh, situation is that the origin of a new sex-specific trait requires the origin of a new sex-specific developmental pathway. So in this case, the sex-specific pathway was built on top of a pre-existing pathway. So you have SCR expression in the front leg ancestrally, and that is necessary to modify the bristle pattern in a pattern specific to the prothoracic leg. So what happens in the lineage that evolved the sex comb is that the new sex-specific pathway was built on top of this simpler, more ancestral pathway. That you had some changes in the regulation of SCR, but the biggest thing was really the recruitment of the sex determination pathway 
into first leg development and the origin of this autoregulatory loop between double sex and SCR. And then, of course, on top of that, SCR and double sex had to acquire <coughs> new joint downstream targets that are responsible for the actual cell biology of sex comp development. So this sets up a really interesting problem having to do with innovations in general. So a lot of the EVA-DIVA work that's been done on morphological evolution has been done on the loss of pre-existing traits. And so, for example, David Kingsley, he gave a wonderful example how the loss of a single regulatory element in a single transcription factor is sufficient for a very major morphological change, the loss of the pelvic fin. But if you think about it, evolving something new is much more difficult than losing an existing trait. That you cannot get away with changes in a single gene. You have to build up an entire new pathway to make a new morphological structure. And we really have a very poor understanding of how that happens. So one possibility that we're thinking about is that co-option of pre-existing developmental modules from a different tissue can facilitate the evolution of a new trait. And so in this case, perhaps the progenitors of the sex combs were other sex-specific, strongly modified bristles, and of course these bristles are found on the male genitalia. That the place in the fly where you see modified bristles most similar to the sex combs are gonna be in the male claspers and anal plates. And of course, these structures turn out to express double sex, no surprise there. So one possibility that we are considering is that if you look at species that primitively lack sex combs, so for example, Drosophila virilis, Drosophila willistoni, their legs are completely monomorphic, but they have these very well-pronounced uh, comb-like structures in their claspers. So perhaps the sex comb evolved by modification of a more ancestral clasper pathway. So one of the things that we try to do is to figure out where those double sex sex comb enhancers came from. And so we looked at the genitalia, and we identified the enhancer that drives double sex expression in the male genitalia, and that enhancer is very well conserved. It functions in species that primitively lack sex combs and other Drosophila species. But the location of those enhancers turn out to be different. So here in blue and green are the late and early sex comb enhancers. And the male genital enhancers right here in between, and as far as we can tell, these enhancers are separate. You can split them up. This guy will drive genitalia expression but not leg expression, and these will drive leg but not genitalia expression. So it does not seem to be the case of a simple co-option of an old enhancer from a new purpose. It, we may be dealing with a really completely de novo evolution of these enhancers. So another possibility that we considered is that leg chemosensory bristles are sexually dimorphic in a lot of Drosophila species, actually in most of them. So we thought maybe the sex comb enhancer could have evolved by modification of the ancestral chemosensory bristle enhancer. Well, turns out the answer is no. So here the chemosensory bristle enhancer is in red and it's really completely separate from the sex comb enhancers. So as far as we can tell for now, we are really looking at the origin of new enhancers from a previous non-regulatory elements, and we're trying to confirm that. So the last little story that I want to tell is to go beyond the sex combs. So the sex combs are actually only one of the many examples of male-specific structures that evolved repeatedly on the legs of different Drosophila, spe uh, Drosophila and other dipteran species. And so here's just a couple of examples. In the Drosophila immigrant species group, in some species, you see this dimorphic brush where males have these densely packed hairs and females look like, well, normal females. You have these pincushion-like structures in the genus of Prionus. And again, these are just some of the examples of things that you see in other flies. And you probably guessed it. If you looked at the uh, leg development of these species, you get double sex expression domains that prefigure the development of these male-specific structures. In each case, you get very good correspondence that if you look at close related species that do not have these structures, they do not have double sex expression in those tissues. So again, in retrospect, this all makes perfect sense. We know that sex-specific development requires double sex, and we now know 
the double sex expression is spatially controlled. So you cannot ex evolve a new male specific structure in a tissue that lacks double sex expression. So if you want to evolve a new sex specific traits, one of the first thing you need to do is to develop, to activate a new double sex expression domain in that tissue. And so that's what we think is happening here, that one of the probably the main, the most important step that was necessary for the evolution of the sex combs and the brushes and the pin cushions and all those other structures that you see was the evolution of new double sex expression domain that is probably driven by the evolution of double sexes regulatory sequences. And so lastly, I want to thank the people who actually did this work. So the work on the, uh, so this work was started by Katara Tanaka and Olga Barmina, and Olga is still working on the evolution of SCR, and Gavin Rice is the graduate student who did a lot of wonderful work on the evolution of double sex enhancers. He should have probably been the one giving this talk. And, uh, but if you want him for his lab, you're out of luck. He already has a postdoc lined up. And lastly, uh, if you do enhance a bashing on really big genes, it helps to get other people to do the work for you. And so I really want to thank Michelle Arbeitman for her work on double sex enhancers and Teresa Rennick for her collaboration on SCR enhancers. So thank you very much. Are you met? Is this even on? Yeah, I, guess, I guess it's on. Oh, that was really beautiful. But um, I do have a question, and that is, it seems to me really important to find out whether transformer is uniformly expressed in all cells, because you push my button. You say cells don't know their sex. Well, in fact, they do. They just can't express it. They don't have a tongue. <laughs> and so, yes, you're right about so that. So the question is, and I can understand why sex lethal didn't evolve targets, because it's very lately evolving. But transformer is ancient. And so my question is why, I mean, if all cells had transformer, then you'd think they would develop direct targets. And double sex doesn't control all aspects of sexual dimorphism. And so it, it is somewhat of a paradox. I and mean, it does seem sort of a crazy way to evolve, to have to evolve a, a tongue and then a language, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you have, if you have any priority. To, it's been difficult to do, but to find yeah. out what transformer expression patterns are. It seems to me that's really critical in this whole thing. Yes, yeah, so I think you're absolutely right. It would be great to find out how transform is expressed. It's one of the million things we've never gotten around to. But so I think the uh, tissue-specific expression of double sex and double sex-related genes is much more ancient than even transformer. I think that really goes pretty much back to the origin of metazoans. Double sex-related genes are expressed in tissue-specific patterns in many different animal phyla. They're involved in the sexual differentiation in many different animal phyla. So I think really the transcriptional control of double sex is the original mechanism for generating sexual dimorphism. And then the splicing-based mechanism seems to have evolved only relatively recently. Actually, don't, not even all insects appear to have it. Uh, it seems that some of the hemimetabolous insects do not do that sex-specific splicing. So I think that in, on the scale of hundreds of millions of years, the splicing-based mechanism of sex determination evolved later than the double sex-based mechanism for generating sexually dimorphic cell types. Artyom, over here. So uh, I'm wondering about the fact that molecular changes in both SCR and double sex were sufficient to give you the morphological changes. So you made the point that it's hard to evolve new regulation and, 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 and the, the fact that those genes are cross-regulatory, it seems like modifications of one or the other would have been sufficient. Yeah, yeah so again, uh, I think you're right that you have to have changed at several different loci to get that innovation. So the test that we're trying to do for that, unfortunately, we don't have the data yet. We want to express double sex in the leg of a species that primitively lacks sex forms. So if we get any kind of morphological modification, it means that some kind of module for making, say, a thick male-specific bristle pre-exists the sex forms. In that case, you can imagine an evolutionary scenario where simply the activation 
of double sex expression in the leg gives enough of a phenotype for natural selection to work with. But we don't have the data yet. We really need to do that experiment. Okay, so we, we should stop. Um, so I want to thank you very much for a wonderful seminar. And uh, just to say the, uh, to one more round of applause for all this morning's speakers for just really wonderful, wonderful work and talks. <laughs>